Okay, so uh, this is us. Um, we're going to talk to you about continuous collaboration and example-driven development. And hopefully what we mean by that will, will become clear over the, uh, over the next 45 minutes. Um, so we've been working together for about three years, a company called Sparkle Coupon Services, which I'll tell you a bit about in a minute. And really, um, we've got a lot of shared values and um, we've, we've, um, we're in a really lucky position working for a small company where we're able to uh, do a lot of the stuff that, that we really want to without a lot of bureaucracy or existing um, processes and methods. So we've had a real journey over the last three years in terms of discovering um, uh, how we like to do things. Uh, so we had a bit of a meeting of minds, partly in terms of some of the values that, that we employ. So, so this is our kind of, this is, this is about our values, what, what we, we all kind of believe in, in terms of how we approach software development. So we're highly motivated by uh, collaboration being, being the middle word and collaborative approaches to software development. And also the use of examples, um, approaches like BDD, um, we'll, be, we'll be talking about some of, the, some of the things in here. But one of the things that, that we had a kind of shared frustration about was things like this. I'm not sure if you've come across any of these things. So I went to an Agile meeting where I was told I wasn't allowed to talk unless I was holding a stapler. <laughs> and this is where, you know, some of the, the very prescriptive... Um, percolation of, of agile messages and methods, particularly Scrum and things like that. Talk about things uh, like um, the Scrum Master must not talk during a Scrum meeting, otherwise you're not agile. You're not doing agile. If you talk, if you're a Scrum Master and you talk during an agile meeting, you're not agile. Um, similarly, if for any reason, whatever the reason doesn't matter, you introduce a new feature into, into your sprint, um, during the sprint, you're not agile, you're, you're not doing agile at all. Um, some of the prescriptiveness of, of those sorts of um, ideologies, a little bit frustrating in that um, it seems that people are kind of measuring or organisations or teams measuring their success in terms of agile based on how well they're doing agile, how well they're doing scrum, how well they're doing continuous delivery in accordance with... Um, perhaps some guidelines that were meant to help companies roll out such practices. Um, and really, um, what motivates us is, is more about getting back to basics. Uh, so similarly with, I guess, continuous delivery, you know, continuous delivery, and this is obviously the context of this meetup, continuous delivery is really hard, um, particularly implementing some of the tools and technologies associated with it. And we've seen um, organisations get quite stuck uh, and in a tangle, trying to um, implement uh, continuous integration environments, um, tools like um, JIRA or, you know, automation processes um, can get in a bit of a muddle um, with some of those things, even perhaps in the context of not even as a business knowing what the most important increment of business value even is. So... So you could be particularly good at shipping software regularly, but perhaps not so good at uh, knowing if that shop software was actually very valuable or not. So some of these things we had um, quite a, a lot of discussion on and, and a shared mind, um, some, some shared views. So, so we like the word agility rather than, than agile. Agile has become a little bit of a dirty word, I guess, in our team for, for some of those reasons. So we prefer agility. We're a small company and we really need to um, be able to respond to change quickly. Um, we really want to focus on our energies rather than measuring our success based on stand-ups or burn-downs or velocity or, or anything else, that those metrics that are associated with, with Agile. We want to try and measure our success based on the impacts um, that, that our, our, our business is able to actually make in the marketplace and how, it, how we're able to move, move forward and achieve our business goals. So I quite like this, this quote here, which is about, um, you know, we, we'd like to find and, and get to know techniques that help us really understand what we need to do next. Um, focus on what the customer really wants, not what they think they want, which is often a, a big difference, or what we think they need. Um, embracing change, I think this, this really um, comes down to sort of the, the, the original principles of Agile. 
And I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with um, Kent Beck's book in 1999, which is Extreme Programming, um, which the subtitle of that was Embrace Change. And that preceded the Agile Manifesto. So the Agile Manifesto was in 2001, and his book was in 1999. And in there, um, he talks about really um, core fundamental principles like uh, test-driven development, um, pair programming, about keeping things simple. He talks about regular releases. You know, all of this kind of um, really useful good stuff that has been precipitated and taken forward with with the Agile Manifesto, and I, I really like that. Um, and in, in, in that um, book, Embracing Change, he talks about four stable values, and I'm not sure, does anybody know about Kent Beck's st four stable values, anybody know about them? So, so he talks about, see if the pointer works, whoops. He talks about um, communication being a core stable value, simplicity, feedback, and courage. And I think courage is quite an interesting one because what he means by that is having the courage to code for today rather than tomorrow, to start simple and allow your, allow your, um, your software and your solutions to grow as you understand more about what's needed, which I think is a really good principle. So these are, these are some of the values um, that we, we share on the team. And then uh, Sparkle, we're a really small company and we're building... Um, technology solutions for retail, um, which are, are really kind of, uh, we're doing things that nobody else is doing. Uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to really change the landscape of digital couponing. And we've got some really cool, neat ideas that are being, we've got lots of interested parties, lots of opportunities. We're a really small company though. So the only way that we can properly um, keep up with, with the big guys around us, the IBMs, you know, the the, the Epsons, all of all those kind of guys uh, in our market is is by learning faster than they can. So so we really want to make sure that that we're answering questions like um, should we build this product, which is a, a, a lean startup thing, rather than can we build it. We want to know should we build this? Are we building the right thing? Um, and talking of lean startup, you know, there's lots of different. Um, views in terms of what minimum viable product means. I like Eric Reese's description here about starting the process of learning as early as possible. And we really believe in this. You know, we're building hardware and software solutions where <coughs> in, a, in, a, in an environment where there's all sorts of different um, nuances of implementations, things we don't yet know. And we recognize that there's a lot of those unknown unknowns out there. So we're trying to find those things as quickly as possible by our approach. So those are kind of some of the values um, uh, that are important to us. Um, in terms of continuous collaboration, this is, this is a bit very tongue-in-cheek. We came up with this model last year, the feedback onion. It was very tongue-in-cheek as a model, but it kind, of <laughs> it kind of stuck, so apologies for that. But um, what we mean by continuous collaboration is um, we recognise that we've got different layers of collaboration in our business. We, and and those, those layers of collaboration have got different audiences, different outputs, you know, different, different types of conversations that we're having um, to make sure that we're on track to deliver what we're doing. And we recognise that even if we're really good at delivering um, rapidly within our small iteration in our, in our development team, um, it could be that you know, we're delivering something that is going to be redundant in, a, in, a, in you know, a while's time or isn't really wanted. So what we want to do is make sure that we're, that we're giving um, the business opportunities for feedback as quickly as possible. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So, so here are our different layers. Um, the business, obviously, our stakeholders. Um, we have projects, so I know there's a lot of... Lot of um, discussion about no projects and things like that. We have projects, we have clients and implementations that have uh, different stakeholders involved. So we have projects and teams that are collaborating around, around those things. Um, business value increment, by that we mean a chunk of value that we think we can deliver, um, a horizon within our project that, that we want to break something down until. Um, we have iterations, so, so we have our kind of two-week iteration. We've, we've now been thinking, we've, because our landscape is changing so much, 
and we've got different um, different clients and competitors. Things change week to week. We've even stopped doing two week iterations and started just doing challenges. So we think, what's the next challenge? What's the next challenge? It might be a four day challenge um, to deliver uh, a prototype unit out to the States, or it might be a week challenge to do a technical spike on something new we're interested, or it might be it might be a two week iteration of a project. So we're constantly having to think about um, what our what what our next priorities are. And then capabilities, you use that word deliberately instead of features, because we're trying to deliver features and stories and whatever we want to call them that, that properly um, map to uh, an underlying business capability. And we use different uh, techniques to do that. So, so even though you know, we're working in an iterative way, we still have to break down a, a big problem into smaller parts. We need to think about, we need to do the analysis. So we need to chunk something down uh, understand what we're trying to achieve um, and make sure that we've got examples, which is what Pete's going to talk about, uh, and um, analysis techniques to support all of the different conversations we need as we dissect that great big ball of mud and chunk it down into, into useful um, blobs of work for us to do. So um, I'll talk you through a couple of these. Um, Lean Canvas is really it's, it's a, just a... Um, a one pager which talks about your business goals based on the business model canvas but more targeted for kind of startup companies in early stages of growth so that's a good way of sharing your business goals and making sure that everybody's collaborating on those um, impact map I'll show you in a minute um, dream demo uh, Pete's, Pete's going to talk about just a way of making sure that we actually have a clear view of what we're trying to deliver to and then we use techniques like story mapping um, and other typical analysis techniques like process flows and other, other use case diagrams and things like that to, to dissect our use of stories into sets of interactions and examples, which, is, which, which we'll get into in some detail. What we're trying to do as we, as we dissect these problems and communicate with these different audiences is maximise the opportunities for feedback and learning. And we're doing that by um, trying to make those learning opportunities really regular and, and happening all the time. Uh, we're trying to maximise the value of those um, interactions by making sure that we're focusing on the high value business capabilities and that we've used techniques to help us understand um, what our priorities are, which I'll talk to you about in a second. And we're also trying to maximise the quality of those interactions by knowing how to collaborate and what different techniques to use to collaborate. And this is something I feel quite strongly about. So I did my scrum master training, however long ago it was. Um, you know, and that was when everyone was transitioning to agile. And I'd, I was running a team of test analysts and developers and business analysts. And I'd been a tester for most of my, for most of my technical experience. And you know, come out of a, a scrum training, and you think, right, OK, so I'm supposed to collaborate now. So all these techniques I've had for the last 10 years, whatever, 15 years, about analysis and how to dissect things, how to evaluate things, now I'm supposed to just have a conversation on a post-it note and it says, go collaborate, and I don't really know what that means. Um, so how do, we, how do we know how to collaborate better in our iterative um, environments that, that leads us to utilise those skills that we have, our analysis skills? So I said I'd talk a little bit about impact mapping. This is um, a really, really useful technique. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of this. Um, Goiko Adzik, um, who does a lot of work in the BDD community, um, wrote a book about this a couple of years ago. And it's, it's really not rocket science. It's about brainstorming based on goals, brainstorming um, stakeholders, which is what's at the next level. Um, uh, then brainstorming from the stakeholders um, what different business impacts uh, those stakeholders can influence, what their expectations are, what their behaviour changes might be um, that, that help enable the goal. And then exploring different options uh, and solutions to deliver those goals. And that leaves you with a roadmap, a, a product map, which is actually a map rather than a list. So the thing about, and this is what Goike talks about in his talks, the thing about, the thing about a map is that it's a map. You know where you're trying to go, and you've got options for how to get there. And if you, if you turn down a particular road and there's a roadblock or 
or, or you know, bad weather and a flood or something, you're able to look at the map and go a different way. Um, and this is really what, what impact mapping gives you. It gives you uh, a reference of scope, which is all on the right-hand side, potential business capabilities, epic stories, whatever link language you use. And it helps you map those stories uh, back to business impacts and goals. So you're able to have a very clear vision as to what you're doing and what your team are doing. So this is a fantastic technique to help um, bring your stakeholders on board with the notions of flexible scope and help identify um, increments of business value to try and deliver first, which, which in, in our view is a good thing to do before you embark on um, continuous delivery or agile practices. And then uh, the last thing that, that uh, Pete's going to go into some detail is, is living documentation. And this is also a bit tongue-in-cheek, the living documentation pyramid inside the Feedback Onion. But, but what, we're, what we try and do with um, the examples that we use that help us do analysis and help us collaborate is also make sure that they're enduring and that they get used as part of our living documentation system. And they help support various user-facing um, needs, as well as supporting regression tests uh, and business-facing documentation. And there's a hierarchical nature of those with, with our examples sitting at the base. And what we're trying to do there is maximise the usefulness of all of that stuff that we're building and make sure it has longevity and that it's accessible uh, and that it uh, helps us with shared understanding. So that's the feedback onion. And I'm going to hand over to Pete. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Um, <coughs> so, uh, one other thing that we found really important uh, on this project is the importance of getting a, a really good team working. And, and for us, that means a few specific things. So, to begin, I mean, we often talk about the joined up team. And what we normally mean by that is a cross functional team, a team that's that's self-sufficient, standalone, it's cohesive, it's got all the functions in it, it's got developers, business analysts, managers, testers, all within one team with no boundaries. And then it's a question of, of what techniques do we actually use to have shared discovery of what we need to learn and shared ownership of what we produce and how quickly can we do that. And uh, we, I mean, we ended up with a with a concept um, of continuous acceptance that we found was working really well. If we, um, I'll, I'll go through some of, the, some of the particular practices that have worked for us. Um, but continuous acceptance, I mean, in brief, it means that if I commit some code, it's accepted by the whole team within about five or 10 minutes um, by virtue of passing CI tests, by virtue of the fact that the people who wrote those tests weren't me, they may not even have been developers. Um, and, uh, and then by virtue of somebody, um, yeah, somebody else being able to look at a deployed environment and verify that change uh, very quickly. So uh, I mean, we found that that's really removed a lot of the problems that we've seen before where we have walls between, uh, between sections of teams and you have to context switch to go back to pick up something that you've worked on before when someone is now ready to test it or the testers have to drop what they're doing to be ready to um, then look at the fix you've deployed to what they tested last week. And, uh, and we, can, uh, we can get a much higher speed way of working out of that. So, um, yeah, I mean, really, this, this talk is about what we do with examples and example-driven development. Uh, a huge amount of that is about how we use them to get the team working really well. But I'll, I'll go through some examples first and uh, yeah we'll see where that goes so I mean, one of the things with examples is there's a question why do we do spec by example anyway and not um, and not specifying rules and oh, this is something Jenny came up with tongue-in-cheek Jenny makes a fantastic flapjack whenever we have team meetups at, uh, at her pod office um, but yeah spec, spec by example um, Flapjack, by example, I mean, it turns out that years of flapjack making experience can be boiled down to three simple tables. And uh, so we've got, yeah, in the top table, we've got uh, several different flapjack names with their, uh, 
with their ingredients and some options. The middle table is quite interesting because it's got stuff you might typically represent as rules, but doing it by example, I mean, what we're really capturing here is some ingredients are more soggy than others. And if you don't want a soggy bottom, you need to change your recipe. Um, and then we've got, I mean, again, tongue, it's all tongue in cheek, but uh, uh, you're going to need different instructions for different ovens. But if you imagine, I mean, horror of horrors would be trying to write this in Gherkin and have it all in uh, given when then steps and, and automating it. You'd never be able to find anything. You'd be going through 30 pages of documentation saying, hang on, we need to change this and this page. Here we can look at everything in one go. If we want to add a new recipe, easy, add a new row. Uh, if we want to say, actually, that's seven ounces of ripe mashed bananas, or, or yeah, seven ounces of sugar if you're doing mashed bananas, it's wrong, bananas are too sweet, we just change it down to six. And this is the kind of approach that we're taking uh, for all our work. Um, it's really about using the right tools for conversations. The other thing we find is that as soon as you sit down with someone and try and capture the rules for how a system should behave, you end up thinking big and, um, and thinking just gets blocked, conversations get blocked. If you can get your conversation down to, you know, give me the most straightforward example, tell me that, we'll write it down exactly with the real data in it. Right, does that cover everything? No, something different happens on Tuesday or whatever it is. Okay, tell me about Tuesday, capture that. And it quite often only takes five or six rows of data to capture everything. And you learn, you learn a huge amount from that conversation. You don't, you don't learn nearly so much from trying to do it rules-based. Uh, and the other thing is then, I mean, the other reason for doing this is it's real world. If you, if you can use real world data, um, I'm sure we've all had experiences of uh, getting getting some code to demo stage, or even worse, release to production. And when someone finally runs it on real data, you know, if it's a trading system, you find out that something's a percentage out or worse somewhere. And it's all stuff that, if you were using real data, would have been spotted uh, before the code was even written. If you'd, if you'd said, this is the example, this is how it's going to look on screen, um, with real world data, you can see it straight away. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's frivolous, but what do we actually do? So, um, for this, I've taken our most recent project. So, um, so right now we're trying to do something on, um, on any till um, that can't be done currently without having to go back to till software suppliers. Uh, we're working, as part of the Save Our High Street scheme, we're working to give individual local businesses the capability to do the same kind of loyalty schemes as, um, as the chains can do. And specifically what we're doing is giving a single loyalty card or loyalty app that gives you a QR code that you can scan, that you can use in multiple businesses. One card gives you a separate loyalty scheme with every business. So it's not like Nectar where you share points across businesses. It's, it's entirely separate schemes, but instead of carrying 20 cards for the shops you go to regularly, you carry one. Um, <clears throat> we, were, we were very pleased. I mean, what, what we're showing here is a three-page spec that came in from our client. And yeah, absolutely delighted by the first line. Scott owns a cafe. This is brilliant. It's an example. It's not a rule. Um, so, uh, so yes, really happy with this. If we, uh, I mean, in this case, this first page is about what Scott needs to do to set up his business on our system and, uh, and how he sets up the loyalty scheme that people are going to collect against. Um, on the next page, we find out that Richard can walk into his local pub, buy some beer, get handed a card, be told you've already got uh, five pounds on this because you just bought around for five pounds. Um, there's some instructions on the card to register and, uh, and then use the app from then on. And on the next page, for me, I'd have preferred if the redemption was Richard as well, but in this case, we got Alex shopping in New You. She's already, she's already collected as much spend as she needs to, and she's ready to get her discount off her next spend. Um, but, but this was music to our ears, to get this in example format rather than rules. 
Um, in terms of what we did with it next, um, Jenny mentioned in the Feedback Onion the dream demo. And very often what we'll do is we'll, we'll pick, uh, we'll try and work out what's the thing that we can demo that's going to give us the best chance to learn something or, or showcase what we need to showcase next. What, fi what feedback are we looking for? And what is the thing that's going to best enable us to get that feedback and learning? Um, in this case, our first checkpoint, uh, there was actually a government grant involved in this, and uh, we had a, a software uh, review um, after a few weeks. And so we planned, a, uh, we planned a working software demo. And with hindsight, this wasn't so great. I mean, we got, we got some examples here. So we're going to, on a pause, we're going to buy 20 pounds of food and drink and then buy 12 pounds. Uh, we've got, we're supposed to be, yeah, if we collect 30 pounds, we get a five pound voucher. Um, and, uh, and then we get our five pound discount at the end. But we did this demo expecting to get some good feedback. It's working software. We just got meh. Um, nothing at all. Um, and we, uh, well, it was actually two days before the proper review, but we, we quickly said, what can we do to change this? And even though we'd been doing the demo on a real till, we'd been doing it uh, via remote desktop and you couldn't really see what was going on. So two days later, without changing the software at all, we did a demo where we, we still had remote desktop on the till to see what was happening, but we had, uh, we had a webcam. I was sitting there in an apron with a little name badge saying, happy to help. I had a little plastic, I had my son's plastic shopping basket. And it was because it was supposed to be a pub demo, then we had uh, thirsty ferret and old speckled hen beers in the basket. And I sat there and beat the beers across the scanner and, uh, um, and all of a sudden, you suddenly got the people in the scenario uh, really engaging, giving us loads of excellent feedback. We learned a lot from that. I mean, they, to begin with, they were suddenly pleased with what we had done, whereas they hadn't been able to see what we had done before. Um, but also, they were able to engage and see what they wanted to do next. So, so it's a real lesson that, um, that working in real-world data completely transforms the conversations you have with people. Um, the other, the other thing we've been doing in the last couple of weeks, we've got a couple of our sales guys have got a space at a, um, at a, at a retail event in uh, what's called the Plug and Play Center in California. And we had to hastily put together some demo kit to, to send them. And so we took the lessons from that and said, well, you know, we'd, we need to send them a real POS in this case. We can't send them a PC-based demo kit with real scanners, a real customer-facing display, a real scanner for the customers to present their QR code to, but more importantly than that, real products and mocked-up coupons. So we put all of this in a box and, uh, and shipped it off. And they're doing multiple demos a day over there. And the feedback we're getting from that is extraordinary. And in a way, if, if it was only a software demo, um, well, what we're hearing from them is they don't believe they'd be learning the lessons that they are about how this is really going to impact the market. Um, so that's, that's a bit about why we use examples and why we work with real world data. Um, another thing I want to say is we, I mean, we talk about ubiquitous examples or, um, or someone called it examples soup to nuts. Uh, but and this, this is an example of, of a page on our wiki that tells the sales guys how to run this demo. And it could be largely text-based. But it's much better if it's graphical and, oops, sorry. Um, and in, yeah, in this case, uh, we can quickly see if you've got a basket with Jaffa cakes in and you try and scan a, mar a coupon um, that gets you 60p off Marmite, then you're going to see a prompt that says qualifying item not present. Um, with hindsight, actually, we should have a picture of the prompt there, I think. But uh, um, whereas if you have a basket with Marmite in and you present that coupon, um, then you get your 60p off. Um, so, so that's great. That's a nice, easy representation of the page for them to work with. And um, also on that page, because it's um, because it's, it's one of our spec by example pages, it's got all the data needed to drive this test. 
um, in grids higher up the page, and they're, they're CSV files attached to the page. We've got test harnesses that let us drive different components of the system with those CSV files. Um, and we've also, if we go down to our unit test level, um, then we use the same data here. So here we're saying, you know, when the offer barcode is scanned and the basket does not contain that item, then the coupon's rejected. And we've got, um, you probably haven't remembered them, but that's the Marmite barcode. And uh, in the basket, we've got the, the Jaffa cakes and we're going to get rejected. In the second test, when the offer barcode is scanned and the basket contains the required item, the coupon is accepted. Here we've got uh, Marmite in the basket, uh, Marmite in the coupon, and we've got Marmite in the basket as well, and it goes through. Um, so, I mean, the really important thing there is that it's exactly the same example the whole way through. So the, the data that we're using to get the best possible feedback from people outside the business about how, how what we're developing is really going to go down in the real world is the same data that's in our unit tests. Um, and there's one other thing I wanted to describe uh, what we do with examples. So, um, so that, that, previous that previous example is all about how we, uh, um, how we use data to set expected, expected behavior. Uh, but we can also use it to structure our development work. And, uh, when we were building this, um, then we found, we started off doing some top-down design um, sessions, and we were trying to build, yeah, what's, what's the perfect way of deploying software to a pause that we can detect, detect what's going on on it, and uh, display the necessary prompts, interact correctly uh, with external services, and so on. And, we were just getting bogged down and planning something that's too big. And it's, it's a real mantra of ours to, to start small and then grow. You usually end up with a much better architecture doing that. Um, so we stepped back and said, what's the smallest thing we could possibly build? And if we're going to do that, we're going to do it with an example. So, oops, sorry. Uh, we are, um, yeah, our very first example here was POSAP rejects an unknown 99 coupon. So we're, we're doing virtually nothing. We're do, all we're going to do is scan a coupon and a scanner. So sorry, I don't know that one. Um, to do that, we don't even need a database of known coupons. So we, we can meet that one within about an hour's work. Um, we're really pleased with that. After, after several long workshops trying to do this top-down design, actually we find we can come up with something that's small enough that you can build it in an hour. And, uh, and keep doing that. Um, our next one is you know, the POSAP rejects a known expired 99 coupon. Well, if it's a known coupon, we're going to need a database to keep our known coupons in. So we've got to build a bit more. But uh, uh, this is a way of working we found, we found very effective. We know, we know what our dream demo is, what we're aiming to demo in a couple of weeks or six weeks or whatever it is. But can we find a way of, of ordering those capabilities those capabilities with something really small first and then grow the architecture as needed for that. And if it's all supported by unit tests, uh, we can grow completely refactor um, and, and get the architecture that we need in a much better way than doing it top down. Um, so just to summarize in what we've looked at in examples, so, so different audiences need the examples represented in different ways, so graphically for the sales guys, with real products passing across real scanners for, for the demo recipients, um, in unit tests for the developers and so on. Um, the value of the example is in the data, so it's uh, yeah, why we use real world data. And, uh, um, and we inform the design by, by taking small chunks one at a time and, and letting the design grow a, according to what's needed. And we, I mean, we feel this really works for the domain-driven design ideal that we end up with an architecture then that really closely reflects the business and where we're, we need to make a change. The cost of the change um, at the code level reflects closely the, the size of the change that's coming in from the outside world. 
Um, so I'm going to move on now to talk a bit about living documentation and what we do with examples afterwards. So I mean, Jenny showed again in the, in the feedback onion, examples are the, are the foundation of our, of our uh, living documentation pyramid. Uh, one of the most important things is the, is the distinction between things that are transient and things that are enduring. And so you use a story that represents a conversation or a bit of work to be done, that's going to be thrown away. And we'll, we'll have a lot of, we'll end up with a lot of stuff on our wiki that, um, that appears while we're having conversations with each other and we're working out what we need to build. Usually once the work's done, that can all be thrown away. Um, once we've locked that in, we can lock down the examples that actually describe that behaviour in its edge cases, and we keep those in a well-organised living document from then on. Um, and then the other thing is, it's really the componentization of examples that helps us, and I want to explain a bit about what we mean by componentizing our examples, and also componentizing our systems. So, <clears throat> Uh, for any system under test, uh, we might want to set up some state. I mean, that would usually be the given of a given when then test. Um, some actions and inputs that would be the when and some expected state and some expected outputs that would be the then of our given when then test. Um, and what we're doing with that is trying to... Oops, I'm going completely the wrong way. Um, is trying to componentize our system but use the same examples and wherever possible the same actual collateral to do that. So and this is a slightly older example when we were, uh, when we were building electronic clearing functionality. So uh, you, you present a coupon for 50p off Purcell at Sainsbury's um, at some point, and Sainsbury's give you 50p off your basket at some point, somebody has to work out who owes Sainsbury's that money. And if we're going to do that uh, electronically, uh, we were building a system to do that. To, to do that, we need to, we need to uh, build a portal of, of coupons um, with the rules for how they should be cleared. And we, uh, we ended up, well, we agonised over what format to do, but in the end we reckoned it's best if our, if our analysts and testers can work directly with this data. And so we opted for CSV format. They can work on it in Excel, it's, it's plain text, we can diff it, we can store it in our, in our version control system. Um, the kind of things we can do, we built a test harness to, um, to allow CSV files to be loaded into our portal. So we... Uh, we uh, blank and reload our portal. It's, it's a Postgres database and we actually rebuild it from the schema up each time. But, uh, and then we populate it with whatever CSVs are ready. The other thing the test harness does is you can give it um, more CSVs and say, what should it look like after? And it will tell you, does the data in the portal look like that after? If we do that, we can put the same data in expected input and output, and then we test our test harness. Does the test harness, if the test harness puts the coupons in the portal and then verifies them after, does it check out? Um, once we'd done that, um, I mean, the first thing we were building was the portal and the actual clearing functionality that I haven't displayed here. But then to demo it, we needed a web GUI. We only needed view mode in the GUI. We didn't need to create coupons in the GUI. So we then, we then do a test. Um, if I put the coupons into the portal and I do my view mode, can I verify what I now see in the web against the same initial coupon CSVs? And once we got this, that test harness, uh, we, can, we can check that all the view screens work correctly. Um, then for a later demo, we needed to be able to create the coupons and edit them in the portal. And again, we can, we can instead drive it the other way, push... Um, use web driver tests to push the coupons in through the web GUI and then use that verification step to say, do they look okay in the portal? And we're, we're isolated from having to test the create and the view functionality at the same time. We separated them. Um, 
And I mean, we do the same thing. I won't go through all of this, but we do the same thing throughout the system where wherever possible, um, we'll, use, we'll use the same textual inputs to, to drive anything down the chain of processing. And the, the real benefit that that's given us is that if, we, if one of our analysts knows that this coupon CSV gets the portal in, into the correct step, into the correct state, they can set up all the tests for the view mode without any involvement from a developer, know that they're 100% right, and then when the developer comes along, all they have to do is turn those tests green. And when you, as soon as they've done that, the work is accepted already. Um, so it's all, it's all part of our continuous acceptance. Um, and finally, I was just going to, a, a little bit more on how we organize things. So I mean, there's, we could show a whole world of stuff from our portal, but um, I, we, actually, it's off the bottom of the page here, but we would typically have work in progress sections that are changing madly all the time and all kinds of conversations are going on. And on our Skype channel, you'll just see, oh, I've just added this new page here, can you have a look? And then we've got, uh, once things have stabilized down, then we've got living documentation sections. And in, in this section here, we've got uh, in tabular form all the data that's used to drive all those examples. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably best if I skip on and we can come back to any questions on that after. So there's, there's a few other principles here. We want to refactor our documentation. Um, we want to really keep the wiki neat and tidy and up to date, move things from work in progress to living documentation, change things as audiences change, change the, change the wiki to reflect the needs of those audiences. And the other thing we've really learned here, I mean, we, we, we nearly fell in love with uh, BDD, Cucumber, Gherkin for a while, and then we fell very out of love with it, that living documents are not the same thing as executable specifications. Um, an executable specification is alive in the sense that because it's executed, something goes red if it goes out of date. But that doesn't mean that anybody ever looks at it. And for us, a living document has to be, uh, has to be something that people go to first, that people want to use every day. And well, we've shown some of the ways um, that we do that. I guess the question is, if we're not executing our specification, uh, what are we doing? in automation. And I'll hand back to Jenny at that point. Yeah, just, just very quick, just a few more minutes, really. Um, so this has been a big question. I've, as I used to be a test manager for a long time and continually looked at uh, test automation um, in various guises. And we had an aspiration of, um, as Pete says, having this beautifully structured living documentation system with a nice bow on top that would then be able to execute the, the specifications directly by parsing that that text into something that was um, readable in terms of our unit tests. But actually, we realized that the value um, for us was mostly in terms of the shared understanding that we achieved from our living documentation and the removing of ambiguities and the clarification given by those data examples. And when we, when we came to nearly uh, turning that into something that ran in Cucumber, we realized that we lost the clarity of that and we weren't willing to to compromise in that direction. So we, this has been said before in the world of DDD, but we, we're very, um, very much about um, you know, conversations. The value of that collaboration is in, is in doing, building the right thing uh, as much as it is in being able to automate it. So what's driving the, the value of our automation? I mean, we've, we've got um, ubiquitous examples that, that Pete talked about. Uh, we want our examples to drive, to be useful for the business and, and be similarly driving uh, the unit tests in the way that Pete described. Um, we realized that actually we had huge confidence in our unit tests and in our continuous integration um, environment based on those unit tests because of those uh, disciplines and practices that Pete talked about. So actually, what's the value in, in automating at a higher level when we're talking more about a specification that sits more at the requirements or, or a specification level? Uh, so what we're actually trying to achieve, 
Well, the main value of that is making sure that the stuff that's being shared with your business and that drives your business goals is the same stuff that's, that's being automated and running as tests. So we actually realized that um, if, we, if we knew that all of our unit tests that we're running were closely related to the examples in our living documentation system that, that Pete described, then actually we'd already have that confidence and maybe we didn't need to try and, and parse uh, the, the language that we were using um, at the higher level. And since we were, sh we were using the same data and the same examples to drive our unit tests using the same CSVs as those that we were referring to in the wiki, and, and actually in the wiki you can plug those CSVs directly in using plug-in tool. So it really is the same data that's driving those tests. Maybe we, we didn't need to worry about it. So we started talking about, well, actually, if every test belongs somewhere on the wiki, and we know, we know um, to which business rule it relates, and actually if you can trace it um, to the different examples and, and um, business value that, that it's intended to support, then we've probably done enough. Um, so we came up with this thing where we now tag um, a test on the wiki with a unique five or six digit number. That same tag exists in the code, so if you, you can search the code and search the wiki for a particular example. I think Chris um, uh, was really pleased when this was working because he, he, was, he was saying, oh no, a test's failing, I don't know why this test's failing, what's going on? So he searched for that tag on the wiki and found that those tests had been striked through <coughs> as, as no longer relevant. So, so we found that um, actually um, what's really important for us is that traceability from the conversations to code. And you know, perhaps it's a little bit clunky, perhaps we've, we've got some new ideas that we're talking about how to make that traceability a bit more slick. Um, but we're not trying to, we're not attempting to automate stuff at that higher level. We've just got a lot of confidence in the stuff running at the unit test level. And actually, in all my years doing test management, the best target for automation was always at the unit and component test level. It was always hard. The harder, the, you know, the higher um, you went up through various levels of system testing, acceptance testing, like, like the V model, it always got really hard and really expensive. And I think it still is. Um, but because of some of the practices we use in Agile, it, things, you know, perhaps we're not so aware of those different layers of types of testing that we do. So essentially, we, you know, we, we're, we're in this cycle. We're, we're having conversations, driving examples. That's informing the unit tests and the architecture. And, and um, those, that, that becomes a continuous uh, collaboration for us and has been very successful for us. And hopefully that's helping us with agility rather than, than agile. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Let me get my beer. I have a little bit. <laughs> Great. Uh, so, where should I start? And I mean, most of the talk is going quite against <laughs> all my thinking. Um, and I'd like to have some type of ask for some clarification. Like uh, you said that you, you are driving your uh, uh, whole architecture, so you, you have basically the same format of, uh, of document going through all your architecture, your CSVs, and that uh, uh, that, that is basically causing the whole coupling. Uh, uh, um, uh, between all, all your components. It's not the interface is there, but the document itself is making an inf uh, interface, making, I, I would assume, making it much harder to change one, uh, one thing isolated from, uh, for, uh, uh, from the rest of it. Right, so I think, um, so the, the CSVs don't play any part in the deployed system. It's just in getting, getting the data. The CSVs represent the minimum, the minimum necessary data to uh, to specify the example and so we um, so I mean, let's uh, I uh, sorry, didn't really that's okay that's exactly what I mean that uh, uh, that, you, uh, that you meant that you have one document one CSV yeah driving all parts of the system all, 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 the, uh, all tests around the system this is the same CSV if I understand the track um, if we can then what the 
what the analysts and testers should interact with, so the people, is the same CSV. And actually, it's really important for something Jenny just said, which is why we don't need to automate at a higher level. If we know that component A, when triggered with this CSV, produces this CSV, or its state can be represented by this CSV, and component B, um, if its starting state is this CSV, um, yeah, that, that test works. Then if those two are the same thing, then we know we don't need to test. We don't need to do the combined test of components A and B at all. We just know they're going to work. Um, but I think, I think it's really important that it's not part of the architecture, though. It's only part of the test harnesses. And so, you know, in one case, um, so, I mean, in the example I showed, in one case, it's a Postgres database. And we've got a test harness that takes the CSVs and puts them into the Postgres database. In another case, um, it's a JSON uh, web request with a JSON web response. And well, in some cases, what the testers interact with is the JSON, because that's a nice text-based format anyway. Um, you could, in some cases, use the same CSV. Um, I think I mean, where we can use a text-based format that the testers that can in interact with, we can put in version control so we can see differences made by people, then, then that's almost good enough. And then if, if a tester... Um, on one of the examples there, I mean, from our portal, we publish XML files. If a tester has to manually create what should be the expected output XML, then, um, then that's fine. They have to do that once, and they'll have to do it again if something changes. Um, if we can do a test harness that says, given this, given this abstract representation of data, it should go into the system through this interface, and we should check it against another system through this interface, and those are completely different. We don't have any coupling to the CSV thing. It's only, it's only the test harnesses. Uh, the, the CSVs are, are for people and test harnesses, and, really. And I'm not talking about the CSV support. I'm talking yeah. about the data yeah. in the CSV. Which, uh, so uh, how do you make sure, let me put it in another way, how make you sure that the CSV doesn't contain more so, so than what's needed for, uh, for a given component? Because if it contains more, then you are allowing that part, the part of the component is to, to have an uh, additional dependency mm -hmm. which, you, which you don't want to have. So that's, I think that's part of the kind of discipline of specification by example and the value in the data that we find. So I don't know how many people here you, you know, use specification by example as a technique, but when we said the value is in the data, what we find in our business is that actually when you're describing a particular scenario, the expected behavior that, that is, you know, where all the logic sits is very much defined by the different data attributes and nuances of that data being evaluated. So in our business, we, we're able to, you know, we're able to identify, you know, 10, 10 types of coupon that, that are meaningful to us. A personal coupon, which is, is something to do with targeted at me, and an anonymous coupon, a coupon which is uh, redeemed for this particular scenario, a coupon which is issued for this particular scenario. And we, so, so we've got a set of maybe 10 different types of coupon which are described by their data, by their data attributes. That's the interesting thing about them, the thing that differentiates the way that that data is handled from the one below. And, and the technique of specification, by example, means that you're very, very lean in terms of the, the interesting data in one scenario compared to the next. You don't, you don't include superfluous data that isn't being evaluated to, to differentiate the type of behavior. So, so what we realized is that the data that we'd spent time uh, collaborating on using these examples um, that we gave a name to became meaningful to us for the whole of our development project, that, that this nice lean set of, you know, six or seven different discrete data pre preconditions um, evoked uh, the majority of the different paths of behaviour through the system by using them in different ways. So, so we can basically, you know, talk about this particular coupon being reused in a number of different tests. Uh, or this particular basket of data, uh, this sort of particular basket of products and coupons being reused in a particular number of tests. And that's what we mean by componentized. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we, we've, um, in our wiki, we, we reuse um, products and baskets and we reuse loyalty cards and we reuse 
coupon types and recognise how important that data is in actually driving all of our systems. And we make the data in those examples. So, so Pete talked about, you know, Scott walks into a cafe. We make the data in those examples, you know, Pete Buckney's loyalty card. We all talk about, you know, we're talking about this, this data example. And we, it's got a name and it, it means something to us. So, so it's just about um, taking something that often happens at the end of a project, which is identifying the test data to support the testing. That often happens at the end, yeah. Bringing that right forward. And, and actually, by doing that, it informs the data, the model, doesn't it? It informs mm -hmm. the data model. It informs how we load our application. And it becomes reusable at different levels of testing, whether you're manually testing or whether you're actually kicking off something automatically. Well, I think the it is an important point about yeah, how many attributes you have. So if we, if we go back... I mean, again, for me, I'd, I just find it much easier to talk about examples. So let's take our jar of Marmite, and then we know what we're talking about. So if we, if we want to tell whether a jar of mar Marmite has been scanned in a shopping basket, we need one bit of information, which is the barcode. So that's, that's great, and that's what we use almost exclusively. If you were building a stock management system, though, you'd need to know all kinds of things like who the supplier was, what their lead time is, how many you typically sell a week, what your current stock level is, um, do you sell different amounts on different days of the week. So, so it's, it's absolutely true that for some functionality, you'll have completely different sets of attributes to others. Um, and, yeah, we'll try and store the minimum... Uh, we quite, uh, and it, it may be different for different things. I mean, so it's not a hard and fast rule, but it's the, the important rule is that what you're talking about consistently is Marmite. Um, and everyone knows what that is. And if you, if you are putting, we're not building a stock management system, but if you were, you'd put the right supplier on it, the right real world supplier. And then if you were talking to someone external about it, they're not going to be thinking, hang on, this isn't right. Um, I think the other thing is I mean, use of um, Nat Price and Steve Freeman style data builders where, uh, where the test will, will just say, I've got a jar of Marmite with this barcode. If that particular component you're testing needs some, some extra data putting in, we'll build it in a data builder behind the scenes. Well, yes, but, if, but even if you build it behind the scenes, it may mean that, 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 that you depend on more than what you really need to. So uh, what I don't believe in uh, normally is discipline. People will just be lazy, put some new things into it, and, and, and you will end up with a huge object, huge document containing the kitchen sink. Yeah. So yeah, we're, yeah, go on. So, like, so I think um, it, the, the bit that might be missing is that for each of those tests, there's a different, a different set of input data at a different, a different state. So you have this one test that tests this one thing and we just have the minimum CSVs or data builder that just support that test. And the next one has a different a different copy of the data. They might talk about the same thing. It might both be Marmite, but it's a different set of data that's just the minimum for that test. So you're not all referencing the same document or the same the same source of data. Okay. Um, so but then what your example was that you can just use the pipeline model feedback, uh, feed to the next part. What came out from the, uh, from the previous one okay, is not strictly true. So one of, one of the things that the wiki allows us to do is um, that there's a plug-in to, to um, Confluence that allows you to put CSVs in, but you can select the columns that you're using. So the, 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 the CSV structure in the background very closely re relates to the actual data model that we need to load up our, our, our applications, basically, doesn't it, in its completeness. But when you're when you're when you're describing an example, you don't need all of that. Um, but there's a location on the wiki where those complete CSVs exist, and you're just able to choose by using that plugin which columns you're interested in to reflect the clarity that you're trying to achieve with the example. But we are blessed in that we have a very small team, so you know we're all we're all motivated to work in the same way. We don't at the moment have you know, challenges around uh, scaling these practices in, in larger teams and, you know, and, and things that might go wrong if people worked in, this, in a different way. So we're, we're going to be facing those soon, I guess, but, um, but not yet. We're, we're really lucky. It's exactly the maintenance part of a uh, uh, part-time, I would be uh, 
worried about not creating something new. Creating something new from a, a small to mid is always easier, much easier to maintain it. And, and, I, and it's not larger things I, I, don't, I don't trust, I don't trust myself. <laughs> I mean, I may have over-egged it slightly. I mean, the important bit is that where you do have an interface between two components, um, then if you, can take, if you can take what you're verifying as the expected output of one and use the same thing as the input of the next, then you get the benefit of not having to test the two together. You can test them in isolation. And that's, that, that's the important thing, rather than necessarily having one ring to rule them all across everything. The question here. That's quite an interesting example you made there of starting small and working with a very small set of data, that minimum thing you want to test. Yeah. And then as you need to build out larger, it seems maybe that practice in your team is starting small. And you said you haven't had to face extending that or scaling that. I wonder what problems the bottom up approach will bring later on. Well, I mean, that's, I guess, um, I don't think there's anything inherent there which isn't, which is, you know, the principle of a, of a that, that could only work in a small team as, as compared to any other kind of practices that teams use as, as they get larger. Um, that starting small, I mean, what it, what it boils down to is, you know, as we're collaborating in small teams, about the type of examples that we think will demonstrate the business capabilities that have value. We think about the particular data conditions that we need and, and the number of different permutations we need to demonstrate that in a small amount. That informs an early data model. We then collaborate again as a team and you know, introduce new scenarios and that evolves and, and the data model evolves. It wasn't, it wasn't a criticism. I mean, the, the no, development no, no. approach as well is is one of starting small and architecting the solution as it grows. And I just wonder about the philosophy as it applies to people as well. Yeah, Perhaps I think there's challenges, isn't there? Just generally, for, for everything that's highly collaborative, when you're working in these cross-functional teams, you know, you're trying to maintain those small collaborative teams in a, in a bigger organisation, which is an organisational challenge, isn't it? About grouping people around small challenges and having them all being focused on that same business value. So, so um, we, were generally, we were generally working like in an XP kind of way, small team, so four pairs sort of thing, um, all, all developers, um, in a sort of world where testers are an anti-pattern and documentation is generally not maintained. So what, what would be the first two things you would do? to implement what you've learned into a team that would operate in that kind of way? So I guess the, the, my first question in that environment would be, how do the business goals and impacts translate into that deve development environment? You know, what do they pick up that they're then successfully pairing on? And there's all sorts of different models of that, isn't there? But at some point, there's, there's some analysis that happens, or there's a conversation, and that ends up um, in the developer's lap. And I guess it, it depends on what you mean by developer as well. So in Scrum, everybody's a developer. That's the law. You, you can't be, there's no tester or analyst. Everybody's a developer. Um, so I guess, I guess it's um, reasonable that you might have people that perform different roles on the same team. So I'd want to Well, yeah, in this example, they're all like Ruby devs, you know, they're all active developers. So how do you, what guides the development in terms of? So there's a product owner. Yeah. Um, who's part of the team. And he'd be probably the only one that's not developing. So, so in terms of, I guess, is there any richness or, or kind of opportunity for misunderstanding in the things that, that you're developing? How often does the product owner say, not quite right, do it, do it a bit differently? Um, so there's, well, it would be four pairs that would be rotating every day, so all the people would be continuously working on all parts of the product, I guess. Um, the business owner will be accepting stuff on a daily basis, like as tickets are finished, who would accept them or reject them, and then build like a weekly iteration planning meeting that would change that. And are you in a are you in an environment where you're building new things and new projects and new capabilities that aren't live yet, or or are you in a maintenance kind of environment? Uh, both. Most people in both. 
Like there's some stuff in production. There are new features trying to get to production. So how does the requirement get translated into what does the developer do? What what does the developer get <coughs> before the before they begin coding stuff? Um, my question is turning into more questions about me. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> but I don't know how to answer it otherwise, because I, I don't... I mean, for, for me, um, for me, there needs to be... Th there's always an opportunity, isn't there? A huge opportunity for, for miscommunication between what's intended and what gets built. And our practices um, our, are attempting to, to bridge that. So um, my questions are based on understanding the complexity of your environment and what the, what the propensity is for those misunderstandings and of course if there's no propensity for those misunderstandings based on what you're doing then go for it do you know what I mean there's, there's no it so, also so, depends so we're, only on trying to, we're only trying to reduce risk in our own environment to, to, to be able to iterate quickly so it also depends on the knowing the future and um, I mean, do you need your, your product owner to have got everything right before they hand the work over to you so do they need to know the future? And if, if they do, but the future is easy to know and they're very good at knowing the future and getting it right, then it's fine. If you're, if you're in an area where there's a lot of uncertainty, then you might need some shared discovery. Yeah, they just need to think they're right when they say it. You can change their mind the next day, right? So what's your process for kind of the examples? For the examples, so, so we, I've mentioned impact mapping. So first of all, we tend to think about the goals and objectives that we're trying to achieve and identify some, some chunk of value which has meaning. And then we start with, um, we do some, use some typical analysis techniques like um, process flows or um, user personas or, you know, just to think about story mapping, to think about the high level interactions that, um, um, that lead to those outcomes. And that's where Pete talked about the dream demo. So we then try and articulate what does success look like um, then we tend to collaborate on a set of sort of high-level examples and high-level data that supports those things, and they evolve. So, so we use, as I think as Pete was articulating, we use different types of examples and techniques depending on whether we're trying to clarify some richness of data or whether we're trying to help our development team know what the next step is. The examples look quite different, but we always try and use real-world examples. Um, and remove the ambiguity that might be associated with a typical requirement spec or something like that. It can be very silly. Um, I mean, when I was boxing up that kit to send it to the States, uh, then it was all a bit last minute. So I just, you know, we got to put some real products in this. So I had a look in our cupboard, had an empty packet of Weetabix, a nearly empty jar of Marmite, got to work, thought what biscuits do the guys fancy, bought the Jaffa cakes and sent the empty box for that. So. Yeah, in, th in that case, it was, it was entirely frivolous what, what happened. But they were, they were doing a demo on a US till, on a, on a UK till, we're a UK company. So did, having it look like we deliberately picked some real UK niche products was, was actually quite good. Um, in other cases, it's, uh, what should we say about your, your various rude stickers about, so the, uh, <laughs> If you see, go, yeah, um, stick it. But if you're planning the dream demo, what, what would be absolutely killer? In two weeks, we could blow people away if we could show this. And you get a little sticker next to it. Yeah, that's the thing we're really going to aim for. Right, what's the, given that we, given that we really can't do anything in this area at all yet, what's the absolute minimum thing we could put on screen that is going to make them believe actually that really is being done? And then can we do it? And, uh... Yeah, I think that's an important thing. I think that showcases are often um, used for just kind of showing stuff um, without that much direction. So we, we place a focus on that. It says, that says, if we were to demonstrate exactly this, you know, exactly this high-level interaction with this type of customer or data, would that, would that be what you wanted to see in two months? And even collaborating around that gives us a good steer rather than just you know, showing them some stuff and, and that not being what they wanted. So, but just by doing that, you know, you're obviously showing stuff that they want to see because they've already had the chance to say, well, no, I don't want to see that. I want to see this. So we just try and get explicit examples at every kind of layer of detail and, and they evolve and get more low level. 
And it's completely different to having a conversation with someone saying uh, where you're talking about a list of capabilities you want in a demo. And instead you're saying, do you want to show this person having this thing happen to them? And, uh, and it may be that you, know, you, you haven't really built the capability, but, uh, or it may be that you're required for that demo, it must be working. But uh, yeah, it just makes for much more interesting conversations and, and always gets you to, um, to a much smaller starting point, which is, which is always better. Did you have any challenges for getting up the BDD in place uh, in terms of learning curve? Uh, cucumber or so so yeah we moved away from cucumber the most the so so we see a difference between some of the given when then um bdd style stuff and specification by example which is much more of, of a method uh, to help remove those ambiguities so when when we got together as a team about three years ago we already had an understanding of that stuff and i brought people with me that i used to work with that i knew also had an understanding of, of that stuff so um, that definitely helped. However, in, in a previous life, when we were trying to implement those things, the way we started was by augmenting what we already had. So, you know, we had some use cases that were a bit ambiguous. And for each scenario in that use case, we elaborated it, it augmented it with some real examples in a table. And we found that just by doing that, and this was even in a waterfall type of environment, just by doing that, we dramatically reduced the opportunity for bugs just massively and then we thought well why do we actually why do we actually state these things you know in this sort of um, abstract business analyst language why do we do that you know when we can say for example you know exactly this and then you kind of think ah well we don't need a specification and a test we can use the test data in the specification and uh, everything's groovy we almost came around to thinking it's misguided in a way because um, I mean, it doesn't matter how much Cucumber pretends to be plain English. It isn't. It's code. It's parsable. And, um, well, Phil expressed this best. He basically said um, writing, writing executable business logic is a specialist job. It's something developers should do. You should trying to have anyone other than a developer write something parsable is always a mistake. Um, whereas trying to get people to organize data and what should come before and, up and after um, is, uh, an is, a, is an analytical job. And you shouldn't, you shouldn't mix the two up. And the other thing Phil said is when he had to go through, look at a load of cucumber was, executable specifications make my brain hurt and my eyes bleed. And he's quite right, you can't read them, so... Um, well, I fully agree to, uh, to that point, on the other hand, as every good list of name, data is good, and good is data. So, uh, yeah, you, you said that, okay, the data is, it, it will be written by the analyst, but how, uh, how to give them... So, I, uh, I've seen example tables which were also good. Um, how can you s uh, just say that it's just data? Don't you have steps in it at all? Yeah, so it's, it is, so absolutely, I, I'm glad you asked that because um, we talked about the value being in the data, yeah? So, so at the point that you've got this, these types of data conditions, there's an evaluation and then there's an outcome. That's something that's quite resilient. The steps that you undertake to execute that might be quite brittle particularly if you've got a user interface or a number of different user interfaces exercising the same underlying business thing. And that, that thing tends to change much, much less often. And this is what I was saying when we were talking about things get harder to automate the more they get like acceptance testing because, because you get more steps, you get more click on this, click that, click that, do this, click that, which is kind of brittle. So um, that's why, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I was evaluating, is it a good idea to run WinRunner in, organization, in our organization? It was like, no, because we have to run that test 10 times to get the money back from maintaining it, and my manual test team only run it three times. So, 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 so that's not a good idea. So um, we, we basically place value in recognizing those different data conditions that drive the underlying uh, tests. 
and try and, as Pete talked about in the componentization, take as m remove the steps as much as possible from, from that activity. Obviously, you can't avoid it. So, so if you had, but it becomes more selective. So if you've got a series of regression tests that executes a really important path through your software where there's value in maintaining those and, and using the interface to drive them, then, then that might be a really good idea. But you're probably not going to maintain the breadth um, that you do at the unit, unit test level. And that's where there's that, the kind of pyramid. So as you get, as you get higher, more removed from, from the code and more towards a business user, um, those, those tests become more selective, um, which is entirely our, where our principles lie around automation, what, what we realised was that actually if we've got total confidence in this and how they, how they build towards the higher level scenarios, then, then we don't need to do it. Um, we come from an organisation that's uh, had difficulty becoming more agile. I think it was a case of about five years ago. Uh, the, the team was told, you're now agile. <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk, you haven't got a stapler, you can't speak. Yeah, so there's <coughs> now a team of about 150 developers, quite large, um, maybe 12 scrum teams within that, um, all quite interdependent on the same software. Um, and one of the big problems that we've had is this deeply entrenched dev versus tester, um, these silos. Um, and we had an interesting conversation today where we presented some similar ideas, uh, particularly on the continuous acceptance, and, uh, like early acceptance, and the constant collaboration through the process. And one of the comments from the testing manager um, in another country uh, was that half of the testers have asked if they should start looking for a job, and the other half already have. <laughs> yeah. How would you um, go about combating that or so working it's, towards? It's really, it's really hard. I mean, I think I said earlier where, you know, the world of Agile, you, you, as a test analyst, who, by the way, I've worked with over the years, some of the most valuable members of my team in terms of contributing to successful stuff have been test analysts. I, I should add that I'm a test analyst. Yeah, so just, <laughs> just, just <laughs> like, you know, I could, so I feel that that, that that group is massively undervalued. And the skills and uh, analytical techniques that you use to come up with those data conditions that exercise that piece of functionality, it's analytical, it's a skill, people are good at it. So to move from that into an agile world where go have a conversation, it's kind of like, it kind of suggests that all of that analytical stuff that you've been doing for however many years is just kind of useless. Um, these techniques that we, that we use um, are really great at bringing those skills back to life. Um, and, you know, it's hard moving into an agile organisation. We'd, we'd rather talk about scaling collaboration rather than scaling agile, you know, focusing on how do we get better about collaborating, how do we um, remove ambiguity, you know, they're much better objectives, I would say, rather than, than being agile. So um, these techniques to, to collaborate on that stuff that testers are good at early, if you can get your team interested in specification by example, and find ways of introducing opportunities to collaborate on small pieces of functionality. You know, I would suggest don't don't try and get some budget or some kind of change board. Just do it. You know, just find the opportunity to do it and start making a difference and start bringing them back in. And in no time, um, the developers are going to appreciate the value of that. I'd say. <laughs>